Hey, it's Jessica Damasa with WTF Health. I am here at Health Data Palooza, and joining me right now, I have none other than Fred Trotter. He is a health data journalist and the CTO of CareSet Systems. So, Fred, good to have you here. Thanks for having me. All right, so you are basically embroiled in a battle with Facebook about data privacy. Mm -hmm. So, tell me how that's going. Tell me what's going on. So, it's difficult. Uh, you know, it's not just me, thankfully. Uh, Andrea Downing, David Harlow, a whole group of people are working on this now. We just had a meeting of those people who are uh, considering what to do and how to respond and how to act. Um, you know, the notion that even a, a team of people is going up against a billion dollar company on privacy issues is problematic. Um, we sent something to Facebook and asked them to fix a bunch of problems that patients had on their platform for privacy issues, and they told us that that was not uh, that what we were saying was not important, but th that privacy is very important to them, oh. which of course is uh, a substantial contradiction even in just that single reply. And since that time, we have filed um, an FTC complaint against them. Uh, we have gone public with that FTC complaint. We have published that complaint on missingconsent.org, uh, which is the place where we kind of give the consent document that Facebook should have on their current platform. And Facebook is amazing in one, one sense, which is they absolutely serve to connect patients, and patients have used Facebook and continue to use Facebook in ways that approach magical. Um, really amazing connections, and there are communities there um, that it, it would be very difficult for them to leave. So we still want Facebook to fix the problems for patients on, on Facebook, but we are working on alternatives, we are working on uh, empowering patients. Mostly, we are working on putting patients in a position to um, have more control and uh, uh, over their data and the computations that are done on data. So uh, Susanna Fox, of course, I'm a huge fan of Susanna Fox, and she told me um, she told me recently that she has a thing, and her thing is that she wants people to stop seeing patients as liabilities and to start seeing them as assets. Mm -hmm. And of course, she says it far more graciously and eloquently, as per everything that she says relative to how I say things. But she does have a thing. Like, she, that's her thing. And if you look at all of her work, it really does fit pretty neatly under that rubric. And I realize I have a thing too, but my thing needs to change. My thing was, I want data and computation uh, to be used for patients and not against them. Okay. Which is a position. It's a position to take. But I realize, and in some senses, it's also a platitude because um, what I should have been saying the whole time is, uh, we need to empower patients to insist that data and computation is used for and not against them. And that's what I'm working on now. Um, so CareSet, my company, has been very generous with our time. At CareSet, we, we do things with patient data in order to uh, create more opportunities for patients. Um, we work with pharmaceutical companies. We work with uh, device companies. We work with healthcare providers. We work with all other journalists with, with the aim of saying, look, can we leverage this uh, data that we have access to uh, about patients to give good things to patients. And, um, and as a result of the fact that we make money in that way, uh, you know, we feel like it's important to spend at least a little bit of my time working to ensure that we put patients back in that driver's seat. So that's, I think, what's what I've been doing with the Facebook. It's really not, it's really not us slash me against Facebook. It's really us trying to put us back in the, uh, the driver's seat as far as patient data goes. You know, the difference between us as a data vendor, and, uh, you know, I celebrate. I think we are a good data vendor, and we can do, we can do amazing things. And, you know, uh, if your audience wants to buy data about the healthcare system, come to CareSet and talk to us. Okay. But, you know, if you want voodoo dolls, we can't help you, right? Which is to say what Facebook has been doing is building these little profiles of people, and then they'll poke them and see well, how they react and whether or not that's good. And if somebody wants to hire Facebook in order to poke that voodoo doll and, and interact with a patient in a way, that voodoo doll stuff, I think that's unethical, yeah. right? And that's not okay. Um, and I think Facebook's going to change, not because Fred Trotter's fighting the most issue. I think, you know, they couldn't give two shits about me. Sorry. Um, they couldn't give two shits about me. Um, and, and, uh, and so I think regulators are eventually going to get wise, and they're going to regulate Facebook. It's interesting, when that happens, what is currently a gray market for patient data is going to become a black market for patient data. And w once it becomes clear that the data will not go down in value, 
but it will become essentially illegal to do the kinds of things that Facebook is doing now. And that, in the end, is what will control the situation, is having regulations. In the meantime, we will do everything we can to protect patient privacy, dignity, and safety um, by continuing to, as you said, fight Facebook. Okay, so in between where we're at now and, and the ultimate aim where this becomes resolved in a manner that is satisfactory to the patient and their ability to you know, not have their, their privacy and their data compromised. Do you think things are gonna get better before they get worse or are they gonna get worse before they get better? So actually, so you asked me this question and I, I paused before so I've had a second to think about it and I don't wanna pretend like I know the answer because I'm talking already. I don't know. And, and so one of the problems that I think with the notions of traditional uh, approaches to this is, am I expert enough to do this? And I think the answer is, although I think I'm probably better informed about this than uh, almost anybody else, uh, I think the answer is no, I'm not expert enough because expertise o is only helpful when you have a precedence, when you have some information from the past that applies to the situation. And we've yeah. never we've never had something like big tech. Yeah. You know, people talk about big pharma, and really we need to start differentiating between, we shouldn't say big pharma, because when you say big pharma, people get all uncomfortable and it's just like, oh, well, that's a bad thing. Pharma, when it acts like good pharma, is great. Yeah. They make cures, it's amazing. When they act like bad pharma, we have a problem. But when we say big tech, I think it's actually kind of valid. It's just like these organizations are so big they can't be good anymore, um, and I think that's a much bigger problem. So I think 10 years ago, you know, I, I was concerned like everybody else about big pharma, and I was concerned like everybody else about Amazon, all these kind of companies. Now, pharma seems innocent and sweet and idyllic to me, and big tech scares me is, a lot. Is it because it's so unregulated? Um, yeah, I mean, it's certainly unregulated, and if it were regulated, things would be better. I think it's also, though, the end of an era. So um, the, the reason why all this stuff is unprecedented is that when we have the debate, so pick your issue. You wanna talk about gun control? Gun control's a really hard issue. Abortion, really hard issue. All of these issues that we've argued about as a society for hundreds of years are really, really difficult. But let's not pretend that when you add intelligence that is not human to the equation, it doesn't change all of these debates profoundly and fundamentally. Uh, when we talk about gun control and we say things like, well, is it the gun that kills people or the people that kill people, those kinds of debates presume and have as their underlying premise that only a person can make the decision to pull the trigger. And that's not true anymore. So now we need to factor in how are we handling artificial intelligence in our weapon systems. And we need to handle, how do we have handle artificial intelligence in our uh, in our advertising systems and our, our systems that measure and, and monitor people and, and the way we connect to it, our communication system. The notion that Facebook itself, independent of the people who work at Facebook, is intelligent is problematic. Um, the notion that that intelligence could potentially be either malignant or even worse could be, um, could just not give a shit about people, could not care. Um, ambivalent, yeah. uh, even ambivalence when you have intelligence that is in that new place, it's really dangerous. And I think it's, a, it's in reality, I think what we're gonna be doing is rather than saying, well, we all understand what Facebook should be like and we understand these new situations, we shouldn't pretend that we do because we don't understand them. And, and we, one of the real problems with Facebook is I think we might be creating a bunch of knee-jerk regulations that will hamper the good things that artificial intelligence could do for us. It's really, really complicated problems that we're discussing here, and we are wholly unprepared uh, to have this. And the real problem I have with Facebook is, I think as distinct from Google and Amazon and the other people, I think there are thoughtful voices that are at least having the discussions at these other companies. But I think inside Facebook, I'm not sure why this is, to get Facebook to change, they seem to have to be shamed from the outside. Like actually just talking to them completely failed for us, but not just us, everyone else who tried that. So, you know, when you can't have a reasonable discussion with a party um, if it, and lives are at stake, it feels like I'm negotiating with North Korea. It's really weird. And, um, and that's not something I was trained for. I was not trained to talk to North Korea. Um, and unlike Dennis Rodman, I regard that as a problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Agreed. Um, no, I want to ask you though. So it's like I, I, I like this distinction that you you've drawn here about 
how things are different at Facebook and the fact that you can't seem to even talk to anybody about changing and you're not dealing with, with well, somebody who's, who's... Let's be clear. Mm -hmm. They were willing to email us. They're just oh. not willing to deal with us in good faith, okay. right? So if I say, you have 15 problems, and they say, we don't have 15 problems, it's like, well, okay. <laughs> uh, you're talking to right. us and you're including us, but we're not having a good faith negotiation. You're pretending like these things are not problems, but they are, and you know it and we know it, but we can't get past that. So from our perspective right now, talking with Facebook is kind of a distraction because I have to choose now between saying, am I gonna go back into a room with Facebook and have another conversation with Facebook, or am I gonna do something which would definitely have a positive impact for patients with my time? And I, I, it's really difficult because the problem is that if I go back with Facebook and I'm successful, Right, so it makes me, like, the reaction is, oh yeah, don't talk to Facebook. But if I talk to them and they, and it and, works, and it works mm -hmm. then a million people could be made safer or a billion, right? So, and so it's like, I don't really have the option, morally speaking, of saying, you know, I can't talk to them. But at the same time, it certainly has not worked. And I'm not the only one who has tried and failed. Um, so, so it's like, now we're talking about like uh, casualty math about whether or not I go talk to have a conversation with somebody. It's like, yeah. well, do more people die if Facebook is allowed to continue on if, uh, uh, and, and I, I'm, I'm not talking to them? Or do more people hurt or injured if I, if I do go talk to them? And that's just not, that is not the way this is supposed to work. No. I was going to ask you where, where I was going with, with saying that. The, the, you know, it's like it's not just Facebook. And you said that there are other, other people in other companies that are able to have more of a negotiation or a conversation with. And I love how you drew the distinction between like bad pharma and good pharma, because it used to be big pharma, right? And I, I think that you're right, that they've kind of moved forward and they're a little bit, you know, they have the, the, the propensity to do either good or, or bad, right? As more tech companies enter into healthcare, and we see this problem that you're having with Facebook kind of, you know, have have the possibility to expand. Is it Amazon next, or is it going to be Google, or is it going to be, you know, whoever? Um, do you do you think that, like, I guess, what do you think should be done on a bigger scale to make sure that you don't, end, we don't, as an industry, end up in the same place fighting this battle with other big tech companies? Is there any anything that you would think that that might help it? Okay, so I have two hopes, uh, okay. two things that I think might work. One is regulation in general. Okay. I hope that the United States will take an approach where it's mostly GDPR compatible, just okay. because I, I'm, I, am a, I am a vendor who's going to have to follow these regulations, yeah. and it's just easier if it's the same. Um, so I, I'm hopeful for regulation. The other thing is we're going to try to create a kind of energy star type fair trade you know, seal of approval oh. where we say, here are the 10 or 15 things that Facebook or Google or patients like me, or um, smart patients, or or citizen, or some other company that is a uh, uh, you know in ingesting patient data can can do these things and respect uh, patients as individuals, but also as patients as communities, yeah. and hopefully that will that will help. I think the first round is going to kind of be it, it's you know have you ever had the experience where you you just broken up with someone and then you just want to date someone who's totally different from them. Yes. <laughs> so I think in some senses our list is a little bit like anti-Facebook, like don't screw us this way that Facebook is screwing us, don't screw us right. this way that Facebook, and so I think it is a little bit gourd tier, but I think if you give it a couple years, we will have a list that becomes more of a reflection of this is the right way for patients and patient communities mm -hmm. to start interacting with digital platforms. And when digital platforms interact these ways, and there are also obligations for patient community. Like there are, there are patient communities, for instance, the anti-vax community, that, that is doing things that are unethical, right? So it's not just things that the platform has to do. The patient community has to step up in some cases and say, we're going to act as good actors as well. But in most cases, the patient community is already doing that. Mm -hmm. And I actually think in most cases, if you are a PHR vendor and you are in the space of offering products to... Uh, patients, and that is your main business, I think for the most part those are good actors too. I think the big platforms are going to have a much more difficult time because they really do have business models that are antithetical, I think, to protecting patient dignity, safety, and, um, and privacy. Okay, last question for you. If you're in one of those big healthcare organizations, and I think like this is one of those situations where I, I like what you said about like this is kind of like such a new issue 
like born of like the last like I mean what like how many years maybe five six years as social media has become you know really like part of our, our everyday lives mm -hmm. you know and I think like it's almost like we don't know what we don't know especially as we start watching the tech companies come into healthcare. Mm -hmm. so I mean I think like where we can affect change is kind of with 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 the players that we know within our own industry so mm -hmm. if somebody's sitting there in one of these companies where they are dealing with um, you know the patient health record or they are dealing with data patient data how how or like is is there what would you advise them to do in order to kind of I guess think ahead for the next five years you know what this data privacy situation is going to look like you know and plan f toward that what would you say yeah it's difficult I mean um, let me tell you why I hesitate to answer that question so as I'm dealing with other organizations, organizations that are not Facebook right now, and I'm, I'm saying, you know, how should they react to Facebook? What should they do? What, what, what plan should happen? I realize that a year ago, I would have advised things, them to do things. Yeah. like Because it's like, you know, uh, hey, you're a patient ad, ad, advocate. Well, you need to get on Facebook. You need to get on Twitter. And you should probably use your real name and, you know, all this kind of stuff that I thought at that time made perfect sense. Sure. But now I realize in retrospect, uh, and granted, there have been... 50 revelations, and uh, the most recent of being that they kept passwords in plain text, where Facebook is just obviously doing the wrong thing very clearly. And, and so it, it's really difficult because a year ago, I just kind of trusted that Facebook was what it looked like it was. And, um, and now I realize that's not true at all. And so all of the advice I would have given two years ago is invalid. And now, at least if there's any takeaway, it's maybe I shouldn't be giving advice. <laughs> until I get all the facts. Well, yeah. And so, I mean, um, so I, the one thing that I will say is, is, you know, this stuff is difficult. It's hard to have a profile and have data on another individual and ensure that that data is being used in, in the right ways. Um, this is really a nothing about us without us thing. So as things change, staying connected with the patient community and staying connected with patients generally, is going to be more and more important for these companies. Like they're going to need to have privacy experts and patients on their board. You know that's going to have to change. Like you can't just have, uh, you know, the CEO of some bank uh, yeah. or you know the CEO of some other great tech company. We need to have people who are embracing um, embracing these kinds of privacy rights. And and really, it's not even just privacy rights. It's mm -hmm. just the latest permutation of the civil rights movement. So I think civil rights experts need to become privacy experts, and so really it will be, you need to have someone on your board who is a civil rights expert, who is a privacy expert, who understands how, uh, how information and, and digital information can be used against vulnerable groups. And it doesn't matter if you're a vulnerable group because of your race or your religion or because you're a patient. Um, so I think that needs to change. Um, so I'm hopeful in the short term of regulations, but I think in the long term, yeah. it's going to have to be a social change. Cool. All right, Fred. Well, thank you for giving us advice without giving us advice. I think that that was pretty wise. Yes. Yes. Well, thought, <laughs> Couching it that way was very, yes. very wise. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure, as always, to speak with you. I'm Jessica Damaso with WTF Health here at Health Data Palooza. Thanks for watching.